So if you if you read at all, whether it's uh, the CN, Fox News, local news, you pick it. Uh, the pandemic has dramatically changed healthcare, and uh, I should apologize ahead of time. If during the pandemic you had to head to our emergency department for anything, I'll apologize. You probably waited for a while, waiting for a bed, waiting for a surgeon or a, a, a physician, waiting for a nurse. That that is the current state of healthcare, and right now I will tell you it's not getting any better. Um, so it's really this perfect storm that's that's shown on the screen. We have labor shortages. Just like every, you know, every industry has labor shortages, healthcare is no different. We have physician shortages, nurse shortages, technologists, you name it, uh, we have major shortages. Um, at the same time, we're challenged with hospital capacity. So the amount of inpatients that are coming through the ED, we're challenged to find beds for those people. And we'll get into some of the stats, which are a bit scary for the state of Oregon. And again, not trying to scare anyone away from healthcare, but that is the current state. So we'll we'll talk about ha hospital capacity, and then the the big one there on the bottom is declining reimbursements for healthcare. Uh, this is a tough time to be in the hospital business. Uh, about sixty percent, estimated about sixty percent of the hospitals in the state of Oregon are running a negative margin. So that's a lot. It's the same statistic across the country. So 50 to 60% of all hospitals across the country are losing money. This is considered to be the worst uh, financial year in 20 plus years for hospitals and health systems. And there are lots of factors in that, but really these three things, you have limited capacity to see patients, you have a limited supply of folks to take care of patients, which means you have to pay them more, and sometimes a lot more to make sure that you can see your patients. And at the same time, there have been challenges and changes with insurance reimbursement, healthcare, you know, hospital reimbursement, et cetera. So those, those three things really get to uh, this, this perfect storm. So here's, here's one of the biggest challenges. Um, and if someone wants to sit here, I'm not gonna, I won't spit on anybody, I'll try. So one of the biggest challenges is healthcare staffing shortages. So you can see the green line there is kind of the staff that we need to take care of patients. It's going up, and that's really particularly true for Willamette Falls because our community is growing. I mean, and I'll show you a slide that talks about the, the five of the 10 fastest growing cities in Oregon. So we need more staff to take care of patients. Uh, our current staffing level is that, that orange line, which is going down. A uh, significant number of early retirements in COVID. Nurses who were five to 10 years from retirement age just said, you know, this is really exhausting. I want to be out. I want to do something different. So significant number of early retirements. Um, and then the blue line on the bottom there should be a little frightening, which is that's our projected nurses in the market. And this is across the country. So the expectation uh, is in five years, there'll be about 500,000 nurses short in the country. So a half a million nurses will be, there will be short that many nurses in the country if we don't do some things uh, to try to recruit and retain and get new nurses into the workforce. So uh, pretty challenging. So some of our solutions, and we could talk for way longer than I have, uh, but retention and recruitment. Obviously, it's hard to, to recruit new nurses when there are very few in the market, but we're trying to do our best. Sometimes that's throwing money at things, which is kind of what we you have to do to try to find staff. And that's um, hiring bonuses, increased uh, wages really to try to be as competitive as possible as we can to get those nurses on site. But the second point of there is probably one of the most important and for, for business folks, I know you all see this and understand this, the culture that we build at the hospital and the cult culture that anyone builds within their business is, is critical to keeping uh, our key folks. So 
our ability to engage with our caregivers, that's what we call our employees at the hospital. So our ability to engage with them, understand what their needs are, understand how we address their concerns and, and help to solve problems and remove barriers for them is really critical to drive the right culture at Providence Willamette Falls and to keep our folks engaged and on site and working uh, collaboratively with us. So I can't underscore the importance of culture uh, uh, anymore. So the other piece is growing our own. The, the first item listed there is scholarships. And thanks to Tiffany and our foundation board, Dan's part of that. Um, this year, our foundation uh, was raising money to uh, create a scholarship fund for our caregivers. So as an example, if you had a lab phlebotomist who was interested in becoming a nurse and she wants to go back to school, those bills are expensive to get back into school um, sometimes it's school bills, sometimes it's daycare, sometimes it's, you know, who knows what, whatever that, that financial hardship is, our scholarship fund is, is designed to provide funds for our caregivers to allow them to improve their kind of career path and their planning. So that's a significant advantage for us to raise those funds and give them back to our caregivers so that they can progress their career at Providence. So I'm really proud of that. We have strong tuition assistance programs. Uh, same, that's the tuition assistance program is is a, kind of a system, a Providence um, kind of policy. So all Providence caregivers have access to that. We talked about retaining caregivers and the early retirements, flexible schedules, obviously just as important. Um, there's a balance to that. Right, we want to be flexible, but we also have to keep the doors open. So that means we have to have people at night who work night shifts and do do other work. Uh, so that's always a balance. And then new caregiver roles. One I put up there is something called a patient care tech. This is a a new role for uh, individuals who are interested in healthcare. They don't have to have a degree of any sort. They essentially come to us and we train them at the hospital on how to take care of patients. And sometimes it's sitting with a patient who we need to make sure is safe. Sometimes it's helping them to the restroom. Sometimes it's helping transport them across the hospital. So uh, not a nurse. They don't have to get a nursing degree or anything like that. Uh, but we're really thinking about how we use new individuals in the healthcare field to help supplement this shortage that we have of nurses. So really critical work there. So let's talk about community growth. I love this slide. So I don't know if you knew this, five of the 10 fastest growing cities in the state of Oregon are what we would call in our catchment area. So Happy Valley, Oregon City, Sandy, Malala, and Wilsonville. Five of the 10 fastest growing. So where Willamette Falls is located on the, what I say kind of on the corner of this Southeast market, uh, this is the only Providence Hospital uh, at, in this location, and you know the closest in towards Portland is Milwaukee, but nothing to our south and east. So our catchment area of patients that come to Willamette Falls is large. And you think you when you look at that, so um, the 1.5 an percent annual growth uh, in our catchment area, but those five cities just tremendous growth. And I'm sure you've seen, I mean, you look at the construction numbers in Oregon City and, and Canby and Malala, I mean, they're, they're through the roof. So a lot of growth and all of that growth is coming to the hospital, which is great for us. We love that. At the same time, we need to make sure that we have the services and the staff to respond to all of that growth, which is, which is part of our challenge. The other challenge is this number, uh, you may not know, Oregon is the least bedded uh, state in the country. So what this says is the number of hospital beds per capita, okay? So we are at 1.6 hospital beds per thousand people in the state of Oregon. The, we are the last, not something I want to be last in. Um, as a reference, uh, 
California is at 1.8, and you can kind of see the, the scope uh, across. And as the West Coast continues to grow, as people are moving to the West Coast and we are not building more hospital beds, this is really a problem. So uh, when you look at growth in our communities at the same time stacked on top of not having enough hospital beds, that's why I'm apologizing if you come to our emergency department. Because uh, it what what happens is we what we call boarding. We we put a patient who comes to the ED who needs an inpatient bed until a bed's available. They are boarding in our emergency department. So they sit in a room. They are taking up a bed, and the, everyone else who is coming into the ED door is having difficulty getting seen because there's no emergency room capacity. And this is. Um, this is a problem at Willamette Falls up the hill, but this is a problem across the state. Every hospital has the same problems as, as we are having up the hill. So you could say, well, Willamette Falls is full. I'm going to go to Legacy, Meridian Park, or Milwaukee, or Providence, Portland. And it's unfortunately the same story. And it all gets back to bed capacity, nursing shortages, physician shortages. So So some of our solutions, uh, we have to be creative, as creative as we can with a fixed footprint up the hill. So we have repurposed some of our inpatient space. So we had some space that was underutilized or we could kind of flex some of that space. So we, uh, we did that, we added eight more inpatient beds uh, to the hospital. We kind of stole them from another department and repurposed them. Um, which I'll get to part of that challenge in a minute. So that was part of it. And then really this creative service growth, this the cancer care services is a key strategy for us. You know, our, our which Dr. Ruzic will talk about, but our outpatient cancer program in the new medical office building that's going onto our campus, it's outpatient, um, but it's really designed to keep patients local. So instead of uh, having to travel from here to Providence, Portland, and deal with traffic and all of that, we want to keep them local in Oregon City. Uh, and that's a, a creative way for us to grow services, um, but it really to serve this community as best we can. Uh, the next is primary care services. We all know there's a shortage of primary care providers. If you're looking for a primary care provider, feel free to contact me and I'm good luck. I'm, I'll help you as much as I can, but it is tough right now. There are shortages of primary care everywhere. Providence, the medical group within Providence, Providence PMG is what it's called. They are looking at Oregon City as an opportunity to grow more primary care, which would be fantastic. Uh, that, that would be great for the community. Um, and then the continuing to serve the community need, and that, that was really my reference to uh, John Custer, who will talk about our, our CAPU, the needs in this community, but really the needs across the state of Oregon for child and adolescent uh, psych. So a real, a real concern. And then last is really a lot of growth that we've experienced, which I have a couple slides on around specialty care. So whether it's cardiology, orthopedics, pediatrics, uh, et cetera. So I'll, I'll touch on some of those. So here's the first one. Uh, Providence Willamette Falls is the first Providence hospital in the state to have a Rosa uh, orthopedic robot. So this was our attempt to really partner with our orthopedic partners uh, who are interested in increasing the care, uh, the efficiency, and the quality of total joint replacements at the hospital. So we, uh, we have purchased this uh, Rosa robot, with, which helps the orthopedic surgeon uh, with mostly with knee replacements, but they can use it for hip replacements as well. Um, this is a, a current trend in healthcare, uh, but we're excited to have it at Willamette Falls to again keep those patients local to to this community. I mentioned the eight new beds that we opened, where we kind of stole from another department. Uh, we had those open for about six months. Unfortunately, they were staffed with traveling nurses because that's all we could find. Um, those traveling nurses, their contract ends 
and they often decide to go somewhere else, travel around, find a, a different place to be for a while. So we actually had to close that unit temporarily in August. Uh, the beds are there, they're empty, and they're ready for patients. And we just need nurses to staff those. Uh, so if you you know have a, a friend group of 20 nurses, please let me know. We, we would happily employ them at the hospital and we can open up those beds again. But it really, you know, those eight beds don't sound like a lot, but for a community like Oregon City, I would love to put patients in those beds and take them out of the emergency department, you know, boarding, because it really helps us get more patients seen uh, when they need it. We have a new uh, MRI machine that was installed in the summer. Uh, we, it's, a, it's a new machine, a larger bore, so we can do more thoracic work, so kind of chest, abdominal work. Uh, we also upgraded some of the software so we can tie into more of the cancer, uh, the, the cancer business that will come to the hospital. So breast cancer, uh, prostate cancer, et cetera. So uh, this will, again, kind of tie into the cancer center growth in the community. So uh, we're, we're very excited about that. So here's a list of uh, additional kind of clinical services that have been either coming up or have gone live in the last year or so. The first is an outpatient intensive behavioral health program. It ties in perfectly with the, our, our CAPU that John will talk about. So on an outpatient intensive basis, when they get discharged to the community, this is our way to make sure that those, those individuals, those patients still have intensive behavioral health uh, care that they will receive uh, when they need it. So that is on our campus. It's been uh, it's been there for about a year. We've expanded our cardiology clinic on site. We've also expanded our Women's Health Associates uh, footprint on our site as well. So two really critical um, pieces of growth for us. We have an arthritis infusion clinic. Uh, that is growing and, and will uh, open up a new space in spring uh, 2023. And then we had some pediatric subspecialties in orthopedics, ENT, general surgery, who moved from their Clackamas uh, location, which was uh, kind of around the Clackamas Mall area, to our campus uh, last year. So they're on site, which is a, another tremendous benefit. And then lastly, before I hand it off to Dr. Ruzic, this is our uh, new cancer medical office building that's going in. So that's a, a current picture on the left. It's it's getting there. It's uh, It'll be very fun. We'll have open houses and all that sort of stuff when it opens in March of uh, 2023. And again, this is really critical for us. And I we talk about uh, uh, inpatient capacity challenges but on the outpatient side, we really want to keep patients local, and this is a great way for us to do this. So I'm going to hand it. I would love to take questions. We'll do that at the end. Um, I, uh, I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Rusic, and I just, before she gets up here, I just want to call out, um, we're all blessed by her presence. Uh, she was named the 2022 Woman of the Year by the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society this year. So it's a tremendous uh, physician and advocate for uh, cancer care in our community. So, Dr. Ruzic. I think so. Sure. Hi, all. I'm Dr. Janet Ruzic. Uh, I'm a medical oncologist for the Providence Cancer Institute. Um, I've been in practice for 21 years, all of that in Portland. Um, I moved here in 2001 um, after finishing my fellowship at Loyola Medical Center in Chicago. And in 2003, I started working uh, in the Clackamas area. And then in 2008, I was hired by Providence and I've been with Providence ever since that time. Um, so we're pretty excited right now to be opening um, the Carol Suzuki Danielson Cancer Center um, this is going to be providing medical oncology services in Clackamas and the Southeast Portland market. And it is opening, I heard, on March 13th, 2023. Um, we were planning on opening that in 
2020, but something got in the way of that. Um, and so we're very excited about this. Um, nearly 2,000 people in Clackamas County will be diagnosed with cancer this year. And Clackamas County has the highest rate of breast cancer in the state and the fifth highest rate of melanoma diagnosis. Providence Cancer Institute is actually made up of, and I don't know if everyone knows this, but there's several locations. Uh, Providence Cancer Institute, of course, has Prov Portland, uh, includes St. Vincent's. We also have cancer service in Newburgh, uh, Seaside, Hood River, and soon to be in Willamette Falls. Um, Providence Cancer Institute treats more people with cancer than uh, any other health system in Oregon. And it's home to uh, research and clinical trials with a focus on immunotherapy. And so um, our home base in Portland is actually giving patients access to these clinical trials at our Willamette Falls location, and also access to uh, world-renowned experts in the treatment of cancer. Backwards. There we go. So um, the Providence Limit Falls is creating a, a capacity on its campus with its Plaza 3 expansion. And it's allowing the Cancer Center to Clackamas because we, um, we had a, a, an office in Clackamas, um, but unfortunately we um, were not able to do future treatments there um, as of 2020. Um, and now our campus is split. We're treating patients actually up at Prov Portland um, and patients are having to drive quite a distance. So we're gonna be relocated at this new location and we're gonna be able to double our capacity, um, trying to serve patients closer to where they, you know, to their home. It is the only cancer center in Clackamas County outside of the Kaiser system. And patients are usually traveling great distances right now from Malala, Estacada, Colton, Oregon City, um, Canby, and uh, beyond just to get their care in Portland. Um, and travel times can be as much as uh, an hour and a half one way. So travel to Portland is a significant impact on our patients and um, their families and their support systems. So this is gonna be what our infusion system will, our infusion center will look pretty soon. Um, I heard the walls are up, the windows are in, um, but we're still working on it. Uh, the Providence Cancer, this, this location will be able to serve nearly all our patients under one roof um, from their diagnosis to their treatment uh, to follow up. And they will have close access to the Clackamas uh, Radiation Oncology Center uh, located on Sunnybrook Road near I-205. Uh, this will be able to save patients um, thousands of trips to Portland for their treatments. They can get their treatment here rather than driving up to Prov Portland and uh, downtown. And um, it's going to be able to access, have patients will have access to clinical trials um, through, uh, we have actually, Providence Cancer Center is one of eight cancer centers in the world that are dedicated to immunotherapy research. And so our patients here at Providence will have, uh, at our new location, will have access to a lot of those trials. Um, and the reduction of the trips to Portland has an impact on reducing our carbon, our carbon footprint. And um, certainly patients will be able to have uh, treatment. Um, you know, we try to make it comfortable for patients. My, uh, I haven't seen the view yet, but um, I was told that out this window, patients are going to be able to see uh, Mount Hood. Uh, and it's just it's just something to make their time pass away because sometimes patients are in the infusion room for five hours or more. Um, so I'm going to stop there, and uh, I guess we're going to answer some questions at the end. Thank you. All right. So now I get to introduce uh, John Custer, who's our senior manager for our child and adolescent uh, psych unit. So, John. It's all yours. Thank you, Brad. Well, thank you for having me here. Um, I don't get a lot of time to talk about my program, CAPU, so this is one of the first. Can you hear me better there? Beautiful. Another privilege is I haven't seen Nick for a year, and so we connected today, so we'll connect after this, so this is pretty neat. So I want to talk about CAPU, Child and Adolescent Psychiatric Unit. 
Um, we're an acute inpatient program that serves kids ages five to 18. Not a lot of other services in our community and outside of our community, so it's pretty special. Um, we're a short-term hospitalization. We really focus on stabilization. We're not going into long-term. We focus on stabilization, bring our kids in and get them home as quick as we can. We opened in 2013. I do have to go through my notes here. We opened in 2013. Oh, I'm terminated, aren't I? This is unique. There's two programs um, in the state of Oregon. We have our adolescent program and then Unity. There's another program in Portland that has an adolescent program. But we are the only program in the state of Oregon for kids. So we have a, a, a six bed uh, program for kids ages five to 12. So we are the only program. The, the next program, you have to travel to the state of Washington, Seattle Children's Hospital for that. So we have close proximity here that we're pretty proud of. Community benefits, what I wanna look at, what is, how does our program benefit this community here in Oregon City? We have a high demand. You're gonna do that? Yes, thank you. So we have a high demand um, for services. Uh, Brad was talking about how many hospital beds do we have in our, um, in our state of Oregon. That also applies to psychiatry. We have limited psychiatry beds. What we have here is um, a number of beds that are specific to our, pro, our community. So we really triage our community. And if we have patients coming to our emergency department, we wanna provide services to those patients first. Um, likewise with that, we have visitation. We have expectations of our families that come here that are in a crisis and we have uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what our families, uh, what the expectations of the family meetings are, but we have close proximity, so we have easy access for visitation and for our families to come for therapeutic intervention that we require in the program. CAPU employees, small program, we have about 80 employees that are hired, and many of them live in Oregon City or the surrounding area. Again, I talked about that with the state of Washington, only have one program. We have easy access here. You don't have to travel out of state for services. And of the, the Clackamas County, this area, about a quarter of our population of missions are from uh, Clackamas County. So I wanna look at how do we look at and, and identify what services our kids receive in our program. There's a lot that's going on. So I picked a fictitious name. I'm going to walk you through Jill coming through our program. But I do want you to know, Jill could be my daughter. Jill can be your daughter. And you have customers. Jill can be part of the customer's family. So I'm going to give you a little walkthrough of what would happen if Jill was coming in a program. We do not do direct admissions. So if you're going to a, a medical office, Patients are not admitted directly to our hospital through that. They're all coming through the emergency department. That's why it's so important for us to have um, our program at Willamette Falls. We really are able to triage and take care of the patients that come through our department or come through our emergency department first. So what happens is a patient, Jill, comes from our emergency department and comes directly up to our program and is received by a nurse. And the first thing you wanna do with our patients is normalize it. These are kids, they're adolescents. They're going through a crisis. They need to know that it's safe and it's normalized. They're handed off to a nurse. Nurse does a, a clinical assessment, a skin check, creates a, a care plan. And more importantly, they let the patient know that they're safe and they can be relaxed and this is normalized. Okay, they bring them to an orientation of the program. They let them know what the expectations are. They take care of them, assuring them it's okay. Another thing we do, Jill would have, well, I will also say with the nursing, the patient receives a nurse. That nurse is providing the care during the day, evening, and night, 24 hours a day. That has nursing care, providing nursing care plan. Likewise, we have child psychiatry. We've been blessed. We have child psychiatry, which is, a, there's a, a limit of child psychiatry practice. 
We have three full-time child psychiatrists with on-call child psychiatrists as well. Our psychiatrists meet with our kids daily. This could be for 30 minutes, it could be for an hour, it could be multiple, multiple times during the day. They follow our kids. So if we have a patient, and our lengths of stay can range from before COVID is seven to 10 days, now it's about 12 to 14. It's lengthened a little bit with the community shut down on service. It's been really tight. COVID has done a lot of things to a lot of us. Um, but our docs will follow our patients the same one. We could have Dr. Chaffin follow Jill for seven days. But if Jill was going for 30 days, Dr. Chaffin would follow Jill for 30 days. Now, another thing that we have, we know with Jill and all kids, it's a psych psychiatric crisis. It's an emotional crisis, okay? The crisis is not limited to the patient. We have the families involved. And this becomes a huge family investment and a huge crisis where parents have to adjust to this as well. So each one of our patients have a family therapist assigned to them. And what's expected of that, there should be, well, it really happens on day one. We have family therapists reaching out and calling our parents, checking in with our parents and setting up a flexible schedule. But what we really want is that our uh, family therapists are meeting with our kids, meeting with our parents at least twice a week. Definitely wants certainly would prefer twice and sometimes it happens more. So we have family meetings happening throughout the stay as long as the kids are in the program. Another thing we have is a structured program and I can't go through all the details of the program, but what I want you to know is we do a group therapy, we provide licensed, some of our uh, master level therapists are licensed. We have multiple master level therapists providing the clinical treatment, milieu treatment, where we or we do mostly group work, do individual work and group work. And we have non-licensed bachelor level therapists providing follow-up skills work. So you have a lot going on during the day. You got nurses, you have physicians, you have master level therapists really looking at what has caused the problem, what's happening here, trying to assess what the strengths are and the skills and working through that. There is a lot going on in one day. But we can't do, these are kids, so we can't just focus on all the problems and everything that's going on and trying to build those skills. We have to have fun. Next last slide. I want to introduce you to our pet therapy. This is Floyd. So once a week on Thursdays, we have our pet therapist come out, spend an hour on the child side because we have a separate child unit. And then we have um, another hour with our adolescent side. We want to normalize what we're doing. So we have pet therapy going. We also have an outpatient um, outdoor rec recreation area. Kids can play basketball. There's lots of different activities we play. We want to normalize it and have these activities. Um, something that I think is really exciting and unique to our program, we have a school. So Multnomah Education Service District provides three teachers and my wife is a teacher. And so we have really good ratio for patient um, to teachers. Three teachers, one in the child program, two in the adolescent program. They're providing an hour a day, sometimes more. And what makes it even more special is if we have a child, if Jill is in Oregon City and needs a transition to Oregon City, maybe she's having an IEP, maybe needs some help with the school counselor. We got other conflicts going on. This outreach teacher can link with Oregon City, can link with the parents and set up a meeting before they are discharged and then make that transition and be there with the school and work out whatever needs to be worked out. It's an outreach program. So actually we have three teachers and one outreach. It's incredibly positive for our program. So we have a, a lot of things happening that are intense with treatment, but we have fun things going on too. And in the evening during the day or during the, the week, uh, we can have movie night, we can have games, we can have play. So it's not just therapy, but it is intense. We're short term. We go seven to 12 days. There's a lot of intense work and a lot of fun. It, it works both ways and a heavy family involvement. So, so now we're looking at coordinating care. So we have all these different disciplines, nursing, doctors, family therapists, all coming together. How do we coordinate the care? 
we meet three times a week, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. We bring everyone together. The doctor leads it. And we look at why was that patient admitted? What's happening with the family? What treatment needs needs to happen? How do we coordinate this care? Three times a week, we do this from the emergency room to when they leave. And we plan, how can we successfully meet these needs and transition them home and have a plan? So it's through our coordination of this care that we pull everything together. And finally, each one of our patients has a discharge coordinator. And this discharge coordinator takes all the information from our parents, our family therapists, from our doctors, and creates a discharge plan that's going to support our parents, to support the kids when they're discharged. What we don't want to have is someone that comes in, a patient, Jill's admitted to the hospital, and leaves without a plan. It has to be coordinated. It has to be a successful plan. So we go from the emergency room, and we go from a, a, a carefully uh, calculated um, transition home, setting up outpatient services, and hopefully the goal is that it's seamless. And all that in a couple weeks of work. So that's GAPU. Any questions? Or is it question times now? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, John. So a couple things here, opportunities for the future. I'll just briefly mention these and then we'll get into the Q&A. Uh, we're going to evaluate, I mentioned the challenges with our emergency department. So we're going to have a, a consultation in 2023 where they're going to come out and look at our emergency department, the number of beds we have, and uh, what does that look like as this community continues to grow? So one of the most important things we can do is always plan ahead for the future, create that vision, figure out how we get there. But as the community grows, we have to grow along with it. So that's a really key part of that. The, the second bullet there is uh, we showed you the picture of our new cancer medical office building. Second floor, as Dr. Ruzic said, is medical oncology. The first floor is empty right now. So we have some plans on how we can uh, move services into that empty core and reopen, as I mentioned earlier, kind of creative use of hospital space. So reopen other beds in the hospital again to serve the community. Nurses are a key part of that. We have to have nurses to open anything. So that's obviously a number one strategy for us. <clears throat> uh, same with our uh, ICU or intensive care unit. Um, same thing as the market grows and as we keep patients local, our cancer community who wants to stay in this community, uh, that will also impact our inpatients and our intensive care unit. So we have to be prepared for that. And I mentioned the primary uh, care growth with PMG. The, the last one on here is uh, one of the more fun things that I get to look at is we are at a, we have a fixed footprint at Willamette Falls. This medical office building that's now going up is the last piece of land that we had where we could build something uh, and keep our parking ratios where they need to be. Uh, so any new growth, uh, either we have to find something immediately adjacent or we have to build up. And if you know, building up is incredibly expensive. Uh, so we'd prefer not to do that. But as the community grows and as Willamette Falls grow, we have to figure out how to do that uh, as best we can. So that's really the long-term growth piece of that. So now we've been talking for too long. What questions? You want me to stay here? What do you want to do? Uh, why don't we invite the entire panel to just kind of be around? We have a lot of questions, which is exciting. Thank you, first of all, to the panel for a great presentation. There's so much going on at the hospital that I had no, no idea about. So um, no particular order. Uh, with the incredible nursing shortage, are the colleges doing anything to try to admit new students since it's often very difficult to be accepted? Uh, Yes, and not enough. So yes, I mean, all of the colleges that are providing nursing uh, uh, candidates to the market are looking at how they increase the numbers of nurses. There's one critical factor there, though, which is the, um, the nursing teachers, the professors. So oftentimes, these are nurses themselves who are working, you know, part time in a hospital and part time for a school. Uh, they are retiring as well. 
So there are challenges with increasing the number of nurses that are coming out into the market because the schools are having difficulty finding nurses to do the training. Um, so there are a lot of efforts, uh, some barriers along the way, and we have to work with the state, um, government, and, and other organizations, the local schools, to try to figure out how we grow that nursing population. So. And Related to the training, there's two more questions. What does training look like for caregivers that are not a nurse? And the second question is, for the care employee that does not have the nursing degree um, that you transit uh, transition with, uh, train to sit with others and help the patients, do they have to be going to school or a medical degree? Yeah, so those are similar, I think. Uh, so I mentioned the patient care tech, what we call a PCT, which is a, a non-nurse. They're not a certified nursing assistant, so they haven't necessarily gone to school for any clinical care. We do that training on site. So we have a, a manager of education at Willamette Falls, and her job is to help with training of nurses and, and non-clinical uh, folks as well. So she has really helped us put together this training program for individuals who want to come into the hospital and provide care. So it's all done in the hospital. Uh, they learn the importance. When we say sitting, um, usually what that means is a patient uh, who is impulsive uh, or who has behavioral health challenges, oftentimes we have to put a single caregiver with that patient 24 hours a day because you have to make sure they're safe. You have to make sure if they are impulsive and they want to get up out of bed that you keep them safely in bed so they don't fall. So there's lots of reasons that we have to have a sitter with our patients and that's challenging in a tough labor market. So we would much rather use a patient care tech to sit with a patient than a nurse. Cause you gotta, you know, you have to maximize the resources that you have. So uh, that really the training program, what it looks like is there's a lot to it, um, but it all is done in-house. Uh, we actually, we started this role in, I wanna say June or July of this year. We started with five open positions. We've now uh, grown to 10 to 15 of these positions across the hospital, uh, just because there's that much need. And there are a lot of people who are interested in healthcare. This would be a great role for someone who's new to healthcare. They wanna see what it's like. They can work in a hospital, and then they can take advantage of our scholarship programs and our tuition assistance programs to then grow that career path that we were talking about initially. So, Okay, I have a couple questions relating to cancer. So would you mind coming up? Um, the first one is looking back, would you go for more beds um, for cancer service? Um, looking back, would you go for more beds in cancer service? Oh, that's actually not a... Uh, more beds. Oh. More beds. Is that for you? I don't know. Uh, oh, would we? Oh, so would I think the question is um, rather than growing cancer services, would we have used that space for more inpatient beds than cancer beds? Um, I'm going to say no. I, I actually think the cancer strategy is incredibly important for this community. Uh, when we talked about the growth in the community, those five of the 10 cities, we talked about our catchment area, who's coming to the hospital. It's, we absolutely need to serve the community with beds. We also have to keep people local. Um, you know, and Janet can talk about this, but our patients, our cancer patients who need care, it's not like they're coming once and then they're done. There are multiple visits over and over and over over a long period of time to take care of them. And we can keep them local and make it that much more convenient for them. That's a critical responsibility of us as the health system to do that. So I think the cancer program is uh, probably more important and we are gonna have other creative ways to add more beds. Would you, I don't know if you... Um, I guess the question was, it seems like cancer treatment resources uh, eclipse heart treatments. Why? And what is the number of heart patients versus cancer patients in Clackamas County? I don't know the answer to the last one. Maybe Teresa, I mean, she'll look that up. Um, you know, I, I, as far as uh, why are there more cancer re treatment resources um, versus heart, I, I think the only thing is, is I, 
certainly many patients are touched by cancer. They know someone that has cancer. Um, uh, I know that certainly we all know that heart disease is very significant and our um, cause of death. Um, I think they both should be getting resources. Um, but uh, I, I think it is, you, you, you kind of have advocacy and there seems, and, and maybe you guys can let me know if you think otherwise, but I think there is more advocacy for cancer. It seems like there's more groups out there, breast cancer groups now, you know, lung cancer uh, groups, you know, trying to raise money. And uh, you don't see that as much in, I think, with cardiac. I think if there was more advocacy, maybe there'd be more attention to it. Thank you. So uh, I think the other thing to recognize, um, so Providence has a center of excellence for heart and vascular cardiac care at St. Vincent's. Uh, world renowned doing, doing heart transplant care now. Uh, significant donation from uh, Phil Knight to grow that service. So there, that's the key kind of inpatient cardiac program is at St. Vincent's. But we have outpatient programming on our campus, again, to keep the patients local. So we have an outpatient cardiology clinic on the campus that just grew its footprint. And we have what's called cardiac rehab. So coming out of uh, you know a procedure or something for uh, heart care, we have a rehab program at the hospital that is more of a, a repetitive program where people spend dozens of visits with us. Again, so keeping that care local for the repetitive types of services. If they need a heart transplant, well, most people will go anywhere for that. And we're lucky enough to have that service at St. Vincent's. Local still, but certainly we wouldn't have the, the need to do that at Willamette Falls. Thank you. Now I have a couple of questions for Mr. Custer. So if you wouldn't mind coming on it. Um, the first is, what is the most common diagnosis for patients in a CAPU program? That's fairly easy. Major depression disorder. So the majority of our patients are depressed and with that comes suicidal ideation. And so that's what we provide is that stabilization of with that diagnosis. Uh, the second question is, how does your adolescent care program get funding and is it mental, is there a mental health insurance? We're funded by most uh, major health plans and it's not a specific mental health um, insurance. It's, it's a medical insurance that we negotiate. Okay, so I think the... You know, this is this is critical. You know, as we talk about the mental health crisis in the country, in the state, locally, you name it. Um, yes, we're funded by local insurance companies, Providence Health Plan, Regents, Aetna, Cigna, et cetera, Medicare, Medicaid, or mostly Medicaid, obviously, in this particular case. Um, but there is a crisis, and it's and some of it is related to funding. Uh, so we have to grow services for mental health in the state of Oregon. Um, that becomes more appealing if uh, for companies to try to grow these services if the if there is a margin in that business. Um, if you were going to grow an outpatient behavioral health program and you lost money, that's not a huge incentive to try to grow that service or, or provide that service. Um, we do okay with the the cap you financially. It's um, it's not great, uh, but we do it because it's in line with our mission and our core values that the Sisters of Providence have professed since 1865. Um, and it's really critical for, for us to remain engaged in the community and keep this needed service. So uh, we do it. It's the right thing to do. Uh, but as always, there's going to have to be some money put behind uh, this mental health crisis. Uh, oh, for cardiac. I was like, I don't know what this means. <laughs> uh, uh, the question around uh, cardiac services, there's 861 new uh, cardiac patients per year in Clackamas County versus 2,000 cancer patients. Okay. So that gets to answer that question. Okay. So uh, next we have a couple of questions about funding. Um, the first one is, do you think Medicare will exercise greater pressure on reimbursements to healthcare providers? What impact do you foresee on your being able to meet your area's needs? <laughs> do I think Medicare is going to 
uh, exercise greater pressure. Uh, sure. I think Medicare, I think every private payer is going to uh, apply pressure. Um, that's a tough one. You know, I mentioned, I mentioned earlier that, you know, 60% of the hospitals in the state of Oregon are going to, are running a negative operating margin this year. Um, it's really hard for our hospitals to stay open, especially the small independent hospitals in some of the smaller cities across the state. Hard for them to remain open if they can't generate some type of margin to ensure that they can continue to invest in their facility uh, and invest in their people. So there is a serious concern about healthcare in this country that over the next 18 months, you will see more and more hospitals uh, closing. It's already happened. You can pull up any national news uh, uh, station online and find health systems, major health systems, ours, Mayo, Ascension, Sutter, you name it, that is closing down services across their service area, whether it's OB services, uh, whether it's behavioral health, whether it's primary care, whatever it might be, but we're, they're closing services because uh, they're losing money and we don't have staff to provide the service. So it's a, it's a real concern. So I think from the payer side, they're always applying pressure, always applying pressure to try to um, create affordable healthcare. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it also has to be sustainable for our healthcare system that we still have players in the market who are providing care. Because if, if Willamette Falls were to close and we closed 50 inpatient beds, where are those people gonna go? There's nowhere for them to go. So it's a, it's a serious concern um, and there's gotta be the right balance to make sure we're being um, affordable and efficient with the dollars that we have and we're not wasting them, um, but that we can create some type of future of healthcare uh, in the state. Uh, the number I've read, the numbers I've read about Hospital Reg Inc. are huge. How can the industry support operation losses and fund expansion to meet the, our health care needs? You've touched on it. Is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah. Um, here, can I have that just to... So how can the industry support operational losses and fund expansion to meet the healthcare needs? It's, it's a, that's a tough one. Um, uh, you know, wish there was a good answer for that. Um, I think we need to figure out how we, we work with our payers Medicare and private payers to ensure that health systems um, have sustainable rates. So our costs have gone up 15 to 20%. We're paying nurses a lot more than we did. We're paying physicians a lot more. Supplies have gone up a lot, just like everyone, right? Cost of oatmeal at the store is like $10, it's insane. Um, but so all those costs are going up but our reimbursement is coming down because of all those pressures. So there has to be some type of uh, appropriate reckoning to make sure that a system, a hospital system, or even a hospital like ours can generate uh, a margin that we can reinvest in the community. So as an example, our new cancer medical office building will cost over probably $40 million. That was not money from Willamette Falls. That was money from our system, Providence, that reinvested in this community. That same system, if you've seen the news, lost almost a billion dollars through the first six months of this year. Now we're a large system, we're 51 hospitals over seven states, um, but a billion dollar loss is still a billion dollar loss. Uh, so for, uh, for Providence to reinvest in the community, it gets harder and harder if we don't figure out how we create sustainable healthcare. Um, so there is no easy answer. It is continuing to work with our providers, doing as much as we can with limited space and limited staff, and ultimately making sure that we're providing healthy outcomes for the patients that come to us. So, What about prevention as a strategy for reducing demand? 
Um, what relationships with other agencies such as Clackamas Fire, School District, Free Bike Helmets, et cetera, might be helpful? Well, Renee or Tiffany might have a good answer for this one too. <clears throat> um, prevention is really critical. Uh, so, so Providence, you know, we have Providence Health Plan. So 600 plus thousand members within the Providence Health Plan. And for decades, we have talked about how you increase uh, wellness amongst your members so that they don't have to come to our emergency department. Those are all great strategies, exercise, eat right, mental health strategies, all of those wellness activities are, are the right thing to do. I think as a society, we have a little bit of a challenge with always wanting to do those things, uh, ma making the time and the energy, taking the energy to exercise and to eat right. Um, I like going to corner 14 and having a burger and a beer. Uh, that's part of my wellness strategy. It's probably not part of another part, of my weight loss strategy. Um, so there are, there are real concerns that we have uh, as a community about how we drive wellness. It's still really critical that we do. That helps to drive affordable healthcare. But when people get sick uh, and they get really sick, they come to us and we're gonna have to respond. So we're always gonna have to be here. Um, uh, we just we have to figure out how we, we take care of an, an aging population and a growing population. As far as the bike helmets and all of the other community activities that we do, there's a lot of them. You want to touch on any of those, either of you? So part of being a not-for-profit health system is the requirement of a community benefit investment. So what you would pay in income taxes, you're required to invest back into the community. And for Providence, we're you know, a multi-billion dollar organization. And I can honestly say we've invested about $1.5 billion in 2021 back in community benefit. So for Oregon, that's about $433 million. And what we do is we have a team that looks at what are those upstream things that we can invest in or partner with those who do it better than we do. Um, anything from food security, healthy eating, diabetes prevention, obesity management in our, in our uh, middle school students. That's a huge population for us. About every three years, all of the health systems in Oregon get together and do a community health needs assessment. Then we each peel off those things in our service areas that we wanna address where we think we can make some inroads. And some of our work fits into those things. We're also looking at how do we wrap around those patients that are most vulnerable, those who are unhoused, those who visit our emergency departments 20 plus times in a month because they don't have any other place to go for care all of those bits and pieces that continue to drive up healthcare costs, but maybe if we get ahead of them, we can reduce the overall cost to the organization. So lots of that happening. I should just ask her. I don't know, I don't know why I'm up here. Okay, so a uh, final question. How has the COVID pandemic changed how the hospital operates as the, pand as the pandemic eases? What does the new normal look like? <laughs> well, uh, if you've been up there, you still have to wear a mask. Sorry. Well, that's certainly changed. Um, you know, early in the pandemic, we shut everything down, right? Uh, we closed surgical operations. We closed a lot of outpatient operations and everyone kind of sheltered at home in the early part of the pandemic. And then what we started to see was uh, a, kind of a market increase in really sick patients coming our, to our emergency department. So instead of going to their cardiologist for an outpatient visit and making sure that they're on track and keeping their wellness strategies going uh, and keep making sure they're on their medications, doing all those things, they were sheltering at home and avoiding some of that because they wanted to avoid healthcare for fear, I think, of coming in and contracting COVID from our organization. And it was new and no one really knew a lot about how it was transmit, uh, the transmission rate and how it was, et cetera. Um, but that increase in acuity of our patients started to put a real demand on our hospital. So the patients were staying longer in the hospital, uh, using up our beds and creating some of this backlog that we have had. So now when we open services back up, we start doing surgery again 
The surgeons in the community have a huge backlog of patients that they're trying to get into the hospital. We don't have beds for all of those patients. We don't have nurses for all of those patients. We don't have anesthesiologists to support the surgeons in the OR. So all of those shortages kind of compounded and that's really that perfect storm that I mentioned um, first in, uh, in our slides. So all of those things compounded all of our healthcare problems. Um, as we come out of the pandemic, we're still there. I mean, obviously we're still wearing masks. We still have patients who are diagnosed with COVID at the hospital, that is not, has not gone away. Um, I think the acuity of those illnesses is changing. As Tiffany said, uh, flu, RSV, norovirus, COVID all together are because people like us are out and about more, you're engaging with friends and colleagues in the community, those things are being spread more rapidly. Uh, and we're seeing a huge uptick of that in the community and it's impacting the hospital. Um, what was interesting about flu rates during the pandemic when people were all wearing masks, washing hands and staying to themselves, there was no flu. It was, it was almost zero. Uh, COVID was being transmitted, um, but now that we're all back out and, out and about, um, it's, it's uh, more transmissible now. And so we're seeing that in our emergency departments. Um, so again, doing what we can to support vaccines, making sure people are safe uh, is really critical. What the new normal is, well, I hope it's better than the bleak picture that I painted today. You know, I think we do need to figure out uh, a sustainable healthcare product that supports the community growth and is sustainable for those who deliver it. Um, and we're gonna have to get there together with recruitment and, and everything else, so. Well, please join me in thanking our panel for providing an excellent presentation.